Hello, it's Cam Spartan Stitcher on Instagram, and I'm back again with another weekly cross stitching update. Today is the 17th of August, 2020. This is video number 82, and I only worked on two whips this week. So the stitching portion of this video will be pretty quick, but then I have some other interesting things if you enjoy my Air Force stories. Um, so let's get started. The first piece I worked on Monday and Tuesday was a Templar Prophecy. I kept working on this knight down here. Again, I try to work on this one to two days a month. And there he is. So I did the plume on his helm and his standard and colors that he's holding. This is in the third shade of blue that also matches uh, his shield. And then the other thing I did was um, I pulled out the working copy. I had printed like the first four pages on the bottom and I filled in the back stitching on the bottom border. That's why I got a, a strand here of back stitching part when I keep going. So that was 777 stitches for the month of August on this one. Um, this is just about, okay, so there's a page break here and just under his colors. So I almost have two pages done. I need to finish the horse. And then there's a um, part of, mo of a motif that keeps going up. So I'll probably fill those in next. So finish the horse and then go to the other motif which is some of the negative space there. So that's the direction I'll head for September. My annual goal on this one, I think, was f having four pages done. It's not gonna happen. But we'll keep working on these two pages and then uh, see where I go from there. This is 32 count Lugana in Silvery Moon. Um, that I got on 123 Stitch if you're interested. And then the other piece I worked on for five days, super size color expansion museum shelf. And I worked down here, I'm still in my dinosaur corner. This page with the uh, big ferns, the pelvis of the T-Rex, and the first little post here from the, from the ropes. You'll see where that is. So over five days, um, I had some things going on, so for the first couple days I didn't get much done. But then this weekend I got a lot done. Uh, so 4,800 stitches in five, 10 stitches in five days. I started Yosemite National Park for the Full Coverage Fanatics National Park Challenge. That was my last park to start. So I have 21 parks done, and the last four are now started. Um, I'm also using this for the Hade 10K Challenge for. August and September. I'm using it for around the world, going to Japan in full coverage fanatics. And I'm counting my stitches towards finishing off the 20 and 20 challenge uh, in full coverage fanatics since I didn't uh, finish that challenge with Macintosh Mill. So that's what Yosemite 20 and 20, Hade 10K, and Japan. I'm using, I'm, I'm triple counting my stitches um just using it for everything oh and i always use my stitches towards the team events in school of magical stitches too so that's five things i'm using these stitches for so 4800 stitches on this page right here that's the whole piece so far you'll see how it's coming together now the plan on this page is that I'm going to do a few more colors on this page and then I'm going to stop for the moment, temporarily, and I'm going to start on this page. And remember, these are, when I say page, it's actually a page and a partial page because I can't point this out and hold it at the same time. Um, so here's the partial page. It's like 25 rows. And then from here to here is the normal uh, Hade size page since I'm cropping out that outer gold border. Um, 
and why I'm doing that, I'm going to do a few more on this page and then start on this one, is because of our next weekend challenge in Full Coverage Phonetics. Uh, so U.S. Labor Day weekend, the 4th through the 6th of September, is Confetti Conquistadors. So work on your piece with a lot of confetti. And this piece certainly does. It's got a lot of detail and it's a color expansion. So there's 125 colors. And every time I get close to a page finish, that's when I really slow down because I have to change colors so often. So I've got a few more colors that are in wide areas like the green on the leaf and in here for the stone. So I'll do a few more colors and then I'm gonna stop on that page and start on this page because the next page doesn't have a lot of confetti. Um, the next page has this big dark area on, you know, kind of behind and, and underneath the T-Rex. There's a lot of black there. Um, and then with these, these rocks, there's just not as much detail here. So doing this dark area will help me get to that 10K for the hay challenge quicker. And then I'll come back and finish this page, hopefully, for Confetti Conquistadors weekend in full coverage fanatics first weekend of September. So, and again, if you ever have questions about my homemade PVC stand, uh, look in the description below for my video links to where I have talked about it. Plans uh, for this next week. I still have to work on Big Red Ship of Life this month. Um, after, and Wednesday, the 52 weeks of block work sale will come out with the uh, really long um, block so I can get the, the rest of the double double toil and trouble quote in there um, and do some more border work as well. So I've got like two or three blocks plus the long block. So I'll work on that one or two days, Big Red Ship of Life. Um, and I may go back to this or I may go back to uh, Haunted, Mansion, Haunted Mansion Stretched Portraits to finish off the last portrait. I figure it'll take me three days. So I only worked on two pieces this week just because of how my, my rotation fit into my weekly video schedule. But hopefully we'll have at least three pieces uh, to show you next week. Uh, you have one more week left to tell me your favorite apple. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, go back to the last video. Um, and so next week in my video, we'll have, we'll find out who gets the prize. And we'll find out what apple variety is most popular. Um, it's close right now between, between two, I think. So that is is it for my stitching content. If that's all you're interested in, we'll see you next week. Thanks for joining me. And now a little bit of life updates and then Air Force story. Um, we had some surprise hail on Friday. The general rule that we follow in our house is um, whenever there's hail predicted with a thunderstorm, if I put my car in the garage, it's not gonna happen. If I don't put my car in the garage, we're gonna get hail. Um, and that proved to be true on Friday because I didn't know we were supposed to, there was good, I didn't know there was any chance of hail. Um, usually we only put both vehicles in the garage during the winter time when it's really cold and don't want to scrape ice and snow off the vehicle, but it's a pain in the butt to have both cars or both vehicles in the garage because the truck is, is so big and to fit both vehicles in, they're both squeezed to the outside wall. So people can only get in and out through the center. Um, so we back my car in so I can get out through the center and the truck pulls in, you know, forward. So both the driver's sides are accessible to the center aisle. And then kids just have to go in whatever side is open. Um, so we don't keep my car in the garage during the summertime because there's usually no need, except for a chance of hail. And we didn't know it was going to come. It was Friday after dinner. I had finished washing the dishes and I was sitting down to stitch on this piece. My husband was outside talking with the neighbors and it just started sounding funny because it was coming from a different direction. Uh, the few trees around us were blowing differently and so we could hear it. And by the time I got up and looked, 
and saw the first few tiny ones coming down and ran out to the garage grabbing my keys. It was too late. The big hail had already started. I had to, you know, jump in the truck and move it over because if there's not going to be another car in the garage, we don't tuck it in. Um, and my husband was running from across the street and he had my car keys and, we, you know, we had to move kids' bikes and things out of the way, like real life, right? You don't have things in wintertime ops all the time. So my car got dinged up, um, got a few dimples in the hood and on the roof of it. And also it chipped the paint because some of these hail balls were a little bit larger than a U.S. quarter. Um, so we're talking almost ping pong ball size since, um, just trying to think of something that worldwide you could relate to. Um, I mean, they were varying in size, but the biggest ones were, were that big. Um, so yeah, my car now has dimples over it and chips, but it's seven years old. So it happens. Good news is the horse trailer's not damaged. So we, I checked that out today. <sighs> And Air Force story. Okay, let me get my, my visual my visual aid. Every once in a while, planes crash. We know that. Um, some of you may have heard of a place uh, within the U.S. called the Boneyard. Um, this is in Davis Monthan Air Force Base in uh, Tucson, Arizona. Is home to the aerospace. Aerospace Maintenance and Regeneration Group, AMARG, used to be called AMARC. Um, so this is where they store planes either for long term when they keep them um, with all their pieces and parts, or they keep excess planes there and uh, pull parts off for the remaining active duty jets to have excess parts in the system. Uh, sometimes these planes are there on a flying hold, and then there's sometimes there's extra uh, Department of Defense assets. Um, previously, the Air Force, and it's not just Air Force airplanes either. This is all four branches and the Coast Guard have aircraft at AMARG. Um, and the uh, Department of Defense has also bought old commercial uh, airplanes before because some of our, our larger airplanes are retrofitted commercial airplanes um, that are retrofitted for a military purpose. So we've bought old airliners, commercial air aircraft, to keep as parts for the ones that we've retrofitted. So there's over 4,000 aircraft there at Davis Mountain. And they chose Tucson, Arizona because it's the desert, it's high elevation, so there's not much uh, precipitation or moisture in the air. The uh, soil is a high alkalinity and it's also packed down very hard. So they have all these 4,000 jets, but they're not on a paved surface. They're just on dirt. And which also, because it's so packed down and um, it's easy to tow them over this dirt. Whereas any other place in the country, a different climate, you'd have weeds and grass and things. Um, and with that comes a lot more creatures that might be looking for little holes to uh, make their homes. So, um, uh, the, what's the word I'm looking for? So because there's a desert and low moisture, there's less of a chance of corrosion. Now, the only problem with being in the desert is that uh, rubber and things with rubber in it have uh, the tendency to dry rot. So the tires, uh, the fuel bladders inside, um, like the wings and the fuselage, um, they're like rubber cells. Uh, so those things degrade because of the heat. And the other thing they do when they um, send aircraft there for long-term storage is they uh, cover it and kind of make it dust proof, at least the, the cockpit areas and, and hatches and things, um, so that the dust from the desert cannot get into the aircraft. Um, so, and believe it or not, uh, you can get on, you can go on a bus tour of AMARG. So, <coughs> excuse me, you, um, I think the bus tour starts off base, 
and then you don't you never get off the bus they just drive through and you see the airplanes you can take pictures um, without leaving the bus I haven't done it but it sounds pretty cool um, I have been to Tucson when because we were stationed two hours away in Phoenix um, and I visited Tucson but I never got to got the chance to take the the tour so in the B-52 community over the last few years two jets have been brought back from AMARG so from the boneyard we have um, had jets there that were in long-term storage and we needed to increase our B-52 inventory uh, to replace planes that had been lost or planes that were told there was one that was was complete loss and the other one had enough damage it was like it was cheaper to bring a jet back from the boneyard than to replace what was um, damaged in a cockpit fire so first I'm going to uh, show you the crash of one that was a complete loss uh, nobody died in this one so it's even though it's a complete loss what happened this was let's see May 2016 in Guam uh, they had an aborted takeoff so the planes taking off fully loaded so full fuel load um, I don't know if it had any munitions on it or not um, but they had a thrust failure they're assuming it was bird strikes because the pilot reported you know when they did their uh, safety investigation pilot reported seeing birds at the wing level as they were committed to the takeoff they heard thuds they heard three so the b-52 has eight engines four on each side and on one side they heard three of the engines after the thud spooling down like they were slowing down and the oil pressure spiked um, and so then they started hitting the brakes and they tried to deploy the parachute that um, they use every time the b-52 lands they have a drogue chute and a uh, full chute that comes out behind it to help slow down the plane the parachute failed it did not fully um, release and inflate and then the so of course because of the full fuel load the brakes couldn't stop the plane fully um, so stopping on the brakes aborting because you did you didn't have enough power for takeoff you had to stop the plane even if it means exceeding what the brakes are capable of so a fire ensued um, also they went off the end of the runway which you'll see and um, one of the wingtips broke off I don't think I've shown it in my videos I think it was only Instagram stories the b-52 wings are massive and so when they're full of fuel they have what are called outrigger um, landing gear so extra landing gear on the wingtips or just under the, the wings to keep the wingtips off the ground um, because the fuselage is so skinny it has a tendency it can tip um, especially when it's full of fuel so they stopped the plane all seven air crew egressed the plane before it went up into complete flames so this is one of the airplanes they they had to replace because obviously nothing was left I have another picture from the top let me find it and of course not much of left not much is left left of that airplane so you can see how skinny the fuselage is compared to the wingspan so there is outrigger landing gear to keep that plane especially if there's a crosswind uh, to keep the wings off the ground um, you can see this side is more burned that was probably the side they had the bird strikes so this is one plane that was lost luckily no lives were lost um, and then the other one there was a cockpit fire uh, on one of the jets at Barksdale I don't think any, anybody was injured in that one but the damage was so severe it was cheaper to bring a plane back out of mothballs if you will from Davis Monthan the boneyard um, and back into operational flight then to fix all the structural problems um, after the fire so in 2015 the first jet to come back was nicknamed Ghost Rider 
because as they were uh, replacing it and getting it ready to fly, it seemed like every time they, they ran another test, they had more ghosts that were, were coming out of the out of the, the woodwork, if you will, that they things they had to fix. So uh, they nicknamed the plane Ghost Rider. So Ghost Rider had been in storage since 2008, so it had been sitting in the desert since 2008, and it's now um, 2015. Although I think they started restoring it in 2014. And what they did is they got it ready to fly. Took a couple months for that to get it ready to fly. And from um, Tucson, Arizona, they flew it to Oklahoma City, which is Tinker Air Force Base, home of one of the um, depots. And then they did a depot level maintenance on the plane to make sure it was okay. So it was a like long 19 month restoration between the two uh, different areas where it was at to get it ready to fly. Uh, let's see. And when they fly it that first time before um, it's fully operational. So when they fly it out of the boneyard for both of these airplanes, they keep the landing gear down and they fly it very slowly because you, um, for one thing, Every aircraft, no matter if it's military or civilian, um, the landing gear are only rated for a certain airspeed. The plane can fly faster with the landing gear up. Um, so when it flies with the landing gear down, they, flow, they fly slower, so they don't put undue stress on the landing gear as all the air is pushing past it, um, and lower, just in case something is going to happen. So here is Ghost Rider. It, as it is landing at Oklahoma City, you see um, is bare steel, and I have some other pictures. There are the civilians at Oklahoma City Air Logistics Center, is what OCALC stands for. So the Tinker Air Force Base Depot. They are um, working on the jet and doing some operational checks. I think I have one more picture. Oh, and here it is, almost ready to to fly to Barksdale Air Force Base in Louisiana to go back into operational status. And they um, put some Ghost Rider nose art is being applied to it. So that was one plane. Um, and then after that crash that I showed you in Guam, they needed to bring a second plane out of the boneyard. Let me show you some boneyard pictures. So all kinds of different airframes sitting on the dirt in the desert. And let's see. And I, I told you about that coating. They, they cover up. So here's a, a Navy uh, Sikorsky H-60, I believe, helicopter. So they, they have this covered up. So all of the important parts the dust cannot get into it and it also keeps um i think there's a it's a two layer surface so the the black keeps it dust free and then the white uh helps keep it cooler here's a black and white picture from 1992 of the boneyard so lots and lots and lots of airplanes just sitting around and let's see. Um, these are Navy and Marine Corps F4s. That they're, um, I don't know how old this picture is, but these are no longer in uh, operation, even in you know active duty planes. So um, when we no longer are going to use a particular model of airplane. They will keep some of them for um, display purposes. When you see aircraft on a stick or museums, they'll keep some of them and then they'll scrap the rest and try to reuse what they can. Okay, the second plane was returned to service uh, just last year, 2019. Again, it had been there since 2008. Now this aircraft had already been nicknamed Wise Guy um, before it went into storage. It took them four months to get it back to flying. 
because the main landing gear had cracks and it also had two engines that had been removed and used for um, active aircraft and again new fuel cells and new tires. They also had to make sure the egress system was up to spec because that is what saves you if there is a problem. You want your air crew to be able to punch out. Even though this is a large airplane and most of the cargo size airplanes do not have ejection seats, the B-52 does have ejection seats. Um, so the pilot, the co-pilot, and the uh, electronic warfare officer are on the, the top and they punch out going up. And the two navigators are in the, the basement, they sit below, and they actually punch down. So they go down through the, the bottom of the aircraft. But to get the aircraft from the boneyard to either uh, Tinker or to one of the B-52 bases, they use a minimum crew of only three people, the pilot, the co-pilot, and one navigator, um, just to, to minimize, you know, you don't need two navigators, you don't need the uh, electronic warfare officer just to ferry a jet from one location to another. So here is one of the colonels. He actually flew um, both of these jets that came out of the boneyard. So he has experience in it. You see the wise guy nose art. And let's see. This one, a little bit about tail flash. Uh, all Air Force jets have a two letter code on their tail that tell you what base they're from. So this jet says MT, so it's actually from this base that I'm currently at, but when it was returned to active duty service, it went to the guard unit down at Barksdale. So uh, it will be repainted with the correct tail flash. So that's when it was landing back at Barksdale. And this is really cool. When the AMAR guys were working on it for four months to get it ready to fly, they found this inside one of the panels that um, a crew chief had written on it before it went into storage in, at Davis Mothin. It says, AMARG, this is uh, aircraft 60-034, a Cold Warrior that stood sentinel over America from the darkest days of the Cold War to the global fight against terror. Take good care of her until we need her again. So kind of gives me chills just because um, it turns out we did need her again. And uh, obviously her kerchiefs cared about her. So uh, the tail number is 60. That tells you she's a 1960 model. Um, so really, she did fly through the Cold War, Cold War all the way through the global war on terror. So that was pretty cool. Let's see. I think that is all the pictures I have for you. Yes. So that is the boneyard and the process of two B-52s that have come back into service um, from the boneyard. So just because they go there doesn't mean that they aren't useful either by um, pulling parts off of them or um, in time of need being returned to service. So I hope everybody has a good stitching week and we'll see you next week. Bye guys.